Hello, my name's Brian Atkinson and welcome to UK Aircraft Explored. Today we shall look at the Spitfire Mark V's undercarriage system. As we work through the related areas, I'll give you extracts from the 1942 Air Ministry Manual and show you my relevant reworked colour AP diagrams. I hope you find this interesting. The Spitfire Mark V's alighting gear consists of two separate retractable undercarriage units which have a track of 5 foot 8.5 inches and a fully castering tailwheel unit. Fitted with Dunlop pneumatically operated wheel brakes, the undercarriage units retract upwards and outwards into recesses in the undersurface of the main plane. The tailwheel unit is non-retractable. Fairings are fitted on the inboard side of each undercarriage unit to form a continuous surface on the underside of the main plane when the unit is retracted. The normal retracting gear is hydraulic and is operated by an engine driven pump and a control lever on the starboard side of the cockpit. An emergency system is provided for lowering the undercarriage. Using carbon dioxide to operate the jacks, this control is also on the starboard side of the cockpit. The hydraulic system for the Spitfire Mark V operates the undercarriage retracting gear and is powered by an engine driven pump. The principle consists of oil being drawn from a reservoir by the pump and delivered to one side or the other of a pair of hydraulic jacks according to whether the undercarriage units are being raised or lowered. The desired operation, either up or down, is selected by means of a lever on the control unit in the cockpit. The control unit directs the flow of oil to the correct end of the jack for the selected operation. The arrangement of the pipeline and components is shown here. The oil used in the system is anti-freezing oil type A. The reservoir for the hydraulic system is mounted on two brackets on the top starboard side of the fireproof bulkhead and is fitted with a filler neck incorporating a dipstick and a gauze filter. The reservoir should be kept filled to the level indicated on the dipstick. The delivery pipe leads to an AGS type filter and then to the engine driven pump that is mounted on the starboard cylinder block of the Merlin engine and obtains its drive from the camshaft. The delivery from the pump leads to a relief valve and then to the undercarriage control unit on the starboard side of the cockpit. From the control unit, two pipelines lead to T-pieces and then to the inner and outer ends of the undercarriage jacks. A further pipeline from the undercarriage control unit leads to a Volx filter where it is joined by a pipe from the relief valve and from the filter a pipe leads to the reservoir. A vent pipe from the reservoir leads down the starboard side of the bulkhead and through the bottom of the aircraft skin, as shown here. The hydraulic relief valve is mounted on the face of the fireproof bulkhead and is fitted in the pipeline between the pump and the undercarriage control unit. Each undercarriage unit consists of a Vickers oleopneumatic shock absorber strut in which air is the shock absorbing medium and oil the damping medium. The strut carries a Dunlop AH2061 wheel on a stub axle at the bottom and is mounted at the top with a pin tool bolted to the main plane spar. An extension lever incorporated in the pin tool bearing at the top of the strut is attached by a universal trunnion to the piston rod of the retracting jack 
which is anchored to a bracket at the rear of the main spar, on the centre line of the aeroplane. Each unit is locked in the up or down position by a reversible spring-loaded locking pin, which engages in a socket on the extension lever to lock the undercarriage down, and in a socket on the side of the strut to lock it up. The locking pin for each undercarriage unit is housed in a mounting, bolted to the rear face of the spar, just outboard of the pin tool. The rotation of the pin is affected by means of chains and cables, one chain passing round a sprocket on the end of the pin. The cables, which are connected to the chain, passing over pulleys on the spar and into the cockpit. Here they are connected to a second chain on the control lever. As the undercarriage control lever is moved to the up or down position, the cables rotate the pin to the correct position for the selected operation. As the lugs on the undercarriage unit engage with the locking pin, the plunger is depressed and a contact switch on the end of the plunger is moved out of contact with a plug. This switch operates the pilot's undercarriage indicator on the instrument panel. The undercarriage control unit consists of a body in which three cylinders are formed and a quadrant in which is housed the control lever and mechanism. The three cylinders in the body are for the piston, the centralising spring and one for the cutout plunger. The cylinder housing the piston contains annular grooves which communicate with four pipe connections as follows the pressure inlet, the exhaust, and the up and down lines to the undercarriage jacks. When operated by the pilot, the undercarriage selector lever moves in a gated quadrant. An automatic cutout in the control moves the selector lever into the gate, when it has been pushed or pulled to the full extent of the quadrant. A hydraulic valve indicator in the quadrant shows down or idle or up, depending upon the position of the hydraulic valve. Up or down should normally show only when the selector lever is operated to raise or lower the undercarriage, and idle when the lever has automatically sprung back into the gate after raising or lowering the undercarriage. If with the engine not running the indicator shows down, it should return to idle when the engine is started. To raise the undercarriage the lever is pushed forward, but it must first be pulled back and then across to disengage it from the gate. When the undercarriage is raised and locked, the lever will spring into the forward gate. To lower the undercarriage, the lever is pulled back but it must first be pushed forward and then across to disengage it from the gate. When the undercarriage is lowered and locked, the lever will spring into the rear gate. A sealed high pressure cylinder containing carbon dioxide that is connected to the undercarriage operating jacks is provided for use in the event of a failure of the hydraulic system. The cylinder is mounted on the right hand side of the cockpit and the seal can be punctured by means of a red painted lever beside it. The handle is marked emergency only and provision is made for fitting a thin copper wire seal as a check against inadvertent use. Shuttle valves are fitted on the inner ends of the undercarriage jacks, their purpose being to seal off the normal hydraulic system when the emergency system is operated. If the hydraulic system fails, the pilot should ensure that the undercarriage selector lever is in the down position, this is essential, and push the emergency lowering lever forward and downwards. The angular travel of the emergency lever is about 100 degrees for puncturing the seal of the cylinder and then releasing the piercing plunger. It must be pushed through this movement and allowed to swing downwards. 
no attempt should be made to return it to its original position until the cylinder has been replaced. The mechanical undercarriage indicator takes the form of a rod of streamlined section which projects through the top surface of each plane just after the main spar and approximately 3 foot 6 inches from the side of the fuselage, as shown here. The rod is operated by a cranked push-pull rod attached to the extension lever at the top of the strut and to a bell crank lever pivoted on the rear face of the spar. The bell crank lever is also connected by a link lever to the rod which is housed in a guide attached to the spar and the top surface of the main plane. When the undercarriage is up, the top of the rod, which is painted red, is flush with the surface of the plane. And when the undercarriage is down, the rod projects approximately three inches above the surface. The electrically operated visual indicator is fitted on the port side of the instrument panel and has two semi-transparent windows on which the words up on a red background and down on a green background are engraved. These words are illuminated according to the position of the undercarriage units. Up when both units are fully retracted and locked and down when both units are fully lowered and locked. The switch for the down circuit of the indicator is mounted on the inboard side of the throttle quadrant and is moved to the on position by means of a striker on the throttle lever and should be returned to the off position by hand when the aircraft is left standing for any length of time. The up circuit is not controlled by this switch. The lamps behind the windows of the indicator are duplicated and wired in parallel. A roller blind is fitted at the top of the indicator and can be drawn over the indicator to prevent dazzle during night flying. The electrical horn for audible warning is mounted behind the pilot close to his head and sounds when the throttle is less than one third open if the wheels are not locked down. The push switch controlling the horn is mounted on the throttle quadrant and is operated by a striker on the throttle lever. When it is desired to stop the horn from sounding, even though the wheels are retracted and the engine is throttled back, the pilot may do so by depressing the push button on the side of the throttle switch. As soon as the throttle is again advanced beyond about one quarter of its travel, the push button is automatically released and the horn will sound again on the return. On later Spitfire Mark V's, the push button used for silencing the horn is not installed. The pilot's control lever for the Dunlop pneumatic brakes is fitted on the control column spade grip. Differential control of the brakes is provided by a relay valve connected to the rudder bar. A catch for retaining the brake lever in the on position for parking is fitted below the lever pivot. Here's the triple pressure gauge, showing the overall air pressure in the pneumatic system cylinders and at each brake. It's mounted on the left hand side of the instrument panel. Here's a view of the brake shoe assembly. And here the Dunlop AH2061 main wheels and the AH2184 tail wheel. The tail wheel unit consists of a swinging arm pivoted near its centre on frame 20 and carrying at its lower end a fully castering fork and Dunlop AH2184 tail wheel. The upper end of the arm is attached to the top of the shock absorber strut which is anchored to a trunnion block at the bottom of frame 19. 
The lower end of the arm carries a vertical pivot for the tailwheel fork, which rotates on two bushes on the pivot and bears at the top against a Ferodo friction washer. The fork is retained on the pivot by a washer and nut and covered by a fairing which is screwed onto the fork. The pivot on the swinging arm is carried in two brackets of frame 20 and is fitted at each end with compression rubbers to absorb lateral shocks on the tailwheel. The tailwheel shock absorber strut is a Vickers oleo-pneumatic type and is of similar design to that of the undercarriage, but smaller. The operation of the tailwheel shock absorber strut is the same as that of the main undercarriage struts. Well that's it for this video. I do hope you found it interesting. Please consider clicking the free subscribe button below and also like to get notifications when future videos are posted. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you again next time. Bye for now.